Yep, we're going to get through this, what we have to cover first, and then we're going to jump into some fun case studies at the end. So um, some different terminology, just because radiologists use so many terms and they use them interchangeably and people get really confused. So uh, we learned about on mammograms, mass is a term. It means that something's seen in at least two different mammographic views. Um, and it's got to be something. Like it has to have some sort of definition to it. It can't just be kind of some wispy stuff on a, on a mammogram. And mass is a term that we can use for a mammogram or we can use it for an ultrasound. For ultrasound, it basically means there's something there. It's not something that's ill-defined. Mammogram means same kind of thing. It's a defined area and you can see it in two different mammographic views. Nodule is basically just a small mass. Um, when things, generally, when things are above five millimeters, we use the term mass, and when things are below five millimeters, we use the word nodule, but some, I've seen some radiologists say nodule and some things like three centimeters. So, um, but generally, the technical term um, is nodule is a small mass. Um, we talked about this also earlier, a lump. A lump is actually a symptom. So it's something that a patient or a doctor feels. Um, a lump can turn out to be anything. It can turn out to be a mass. It can turn out to be normal tissue. Um, so lump just is a symptom. Um, also, we hear the word lesion. Um, I would say most commonly um, lesion tends to go along with things that are worrisome in the breast. That's when I see the radiologist um, using that term most of the time, but I have heard them refer to benign things as lesions. Um, and it just basically means an injury to the living tissue in the body, um, some sort of tissue damage. Um, but it's tissue damage not due to trauma. So there's lots of things we're going to talk about later that cause damage to tissue, like cancers, that are not due to any sort of harm to the tissue. And then we have the word tumor. Uh, this is when um, something in the body swells, but, um, and it, but it's without inflammation. And why something swells in the body is because the tissue is growing abnormally, kind of out of control. Um, but a tumor, I would say generally we use that with malignancies, that, that is most commonly associated with that term, but you can have a benign tumor as well, just to make it a little more confusing. <laughs> and then we have the word neoplasm. Um, and this is what they say, uh, it's a new growth in the body, it's an abnormal growth of tissue, um, off, you know, when cells are multiplying out of control. Um, a neoplasm can be benign or malignant. I'd say most people commonly associate it with malignancy, but can be benign. So as you can see, a lot of these terms have a lot of overlap. Um, you'll hear them a lot by radiologists. So uh, they tend to kind of mean similar things. The only one that is primarily extremely different in this list is lump. So I want you guys out of this list to remember, you know, mass, nodule, lesion, tumor, neoplasm, all are pretty interchangeable terms. It basically means there's something going on in the breast, but a lump is a symptom. So what does benign and malignant mean? Um, this is really the cornerstone of ultrasound. We have to know what we're looking for, what bad things can be there, because if we don't, we don't know what we're looking for. Uh, so benign means... Um, the cells are growing, they're dividing out of control, um, but the cells still look normal at the structure level. Um, and the cells do not have the cap capability to invade surrounding tissues or metastasize. Metastasize means travel somewhere else in the body. Um, benign things, even though they can't invade tissue around them, they can push things out of the way. So that's when they, when they become what we call locally aggressive. So if you have something that's cancer, which is a malignancy, so cancer grows into things next to it and invades the, the tissue planes next to it, where something benign pushes all the tissue planes out of the way. Um, something benign doesn't have the capability to invade adjacent tissue planes, the worst it can do is push them out of the way. But as it gets bigger, you can imagine it really starts to push things around. As it pushes things way out of control, um, we say this is something locally aggressive because it's now deforming the tissues around it by displacing everything. 
or something malignant. Malignant means um, now the cells have become an abnormal structure. They're no longer normal in structure. And they now have the capacity to um, invade tissue next to it. And they also have the capacity to uh, metastasize or go distantly in the body. So that's the difference between benign and malignant. By rats. So this is really important for you guys to know if you go into breast imaging. Um, doctors talk in by rats. This is how they talk to us on pretty much every case. So often a radiologist will not give me a result, uh, like say, oh, this is a cyst, go tell the patient. They will say, oh, yeah, benign, by rats too. So I need to know what these by rats categories are. Um, this is the system that radiologists use, the American College of Radiology, to classify breast lesions. It's specific to breast. Um, every single patient that walks in the door gets assigned one of these bi -rads categories. Um, so there is seven categories. It starts at bi -rad zero and goes all the way to bi -rad six. Um, for the test, what you need to know is the bi -rad number and just the basic information about what it is and what might fit into that category. And this is a really important thing to know for the test. Like, for instance, I might say, what category will assist be in, in a bi -rads category? So we're going to learn now the bi -rads categories, and later we'll learn the pathologies that fit into these categories. So the first category, bi -rad zero, this means the study is incomplete. So it means that the radiologist um, can't finish the study without some additional information. So maybe this patient needs more imaging. You know, maybe they came in for their screening mammogram. They see something on the screening mammogram, and they know we need to bring this patient back to do more pictures. Or perhaps the patient came in for their diagnostic mammogram workup and ultrasound workup, and now we know this patient needs a biopsy. Sometimes they'll give them an incomplete category, saying that this patient just needs something more. BIREDS 1 category is negative. This means um, everything was normal. So when radiologists classify into these categories, what they're trying to figure out is what is the chance of malignancy in a category. So this first category, BIREDS 1 negative, means whatever we found um, was either completely normal or it has a 0% chance of malignancy. So something that might go in this category um, would be a patient, you know, feels a lump and we see nothing there, we just see normal tissue. So the test would be negative and likelihood of malignancy, 0%. Now, some radiologists say, well, that's not true because even though we didn't see anything, likelihood of malignancy is greater than 0%. You can have something that doesn't show up on a mammogram or ultrasound. So some radiologists will put negative, some radiologists classify negative things differently. Is this interchangeable with ultrasound and mammogram? Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, BIREDS 2 is our benign category. So this category means when we found something on the ultrasound or the mammogram, um, it winded up being something benign. So cases where we would use this is if we found a cyst, and we're going to learn more about what cysts are later in the different pathologies. Um, we would use this category um, if we like were scanning and found a normal lymph node that we don't need to do anything about. So BIREDS2 benign means the chance of malignancy is 0%. Um, meaning we don't have to do anything else with the area uh, or with this patient. We can just ha let them have just their normal annual screening mammogram. And then we go into BIREDS3. This is our probably benign category. A um, lot of things end up in this category. So when a radiologist finds something on a mammogram and or an ultrasound, they characterize the area. We're going to learn how they do that tonight. Um, when they categorize an area, they need to figure out um, does it fit into one of three categories? Uh, when we characterize an, or one of four categories, it's either completely benign, meaning we don't have to do anything with it, which be, would be our BIREDS2. It could be probably benign, meaning they think it's a very good chance it's going to be something benign. It has all benign features. Chance of malignancy is less than 2%. Um, in cases like that, we usually just do a short interval follow-up, either mammogram or ultrasound. Um, we do that for a two-year period, every six months for two years, to make sure that whatever we found that's likely benign is stable. 
Um, or a radiologist might say, you know, this, this has worrisome features to it. So um, when things have worrisome features, we biopsy them. Anything that has a greater than 2% chance of malignancy gets a tissue diagnosis because you don't want to mess around with stuff. You don't want to miss something in the breast. So um, the next category on this scale would be BIRADS4. BIRADS4 means suspicious. Suspicious does not mean cancer. Things that even have very benign features are suspicious. Suspicious means it requires a tissue diagnosis, meaning we need to do a biopsy, um, we need to do a surgery to take it out, we need to do something to test that tissue to find out what it is. And they put uh, BIRADS4 into three different categories. Um, whoops, wrong button. You don't need to know the difference between these three categories, but just something kind of, if you hear doctors talk about them, that's what it is. Uh, so BIRADS 4A is our first type of BIRADS 4 category. Um, chance of malignancy between 2 and 10%. Um, so really a low suspicion for malignancy. Um, many things that we bi biopsy go into this category, meaning it needs a tissue sample to figure out what it is, but they're not really worried about it. Um, if the doctor's a little bit more worried about it, we put it, call it a BIRADS 4B, um, meaning chance of malignancy between 10 and 50%. Um, and then our BIRADS 4C category. BIRADS 4C is a very um, suspicious category. A chance of malignancy between 50 and 95%. Doctors use this category when they're not entirely sure it's gonna be cancer, but it has some really ugly features that are pointing them towards that. And they're worried that it really needs to uh, come out no matter what. So if we find something ugly on a ultrasound, but it maybe is not quite so suspicious on a mammogram, um, often, you know, they might give it a BIRADS 4C. Um, BIRADS 4C means that no matter what happens, even if we biopsy it and it comes back benign, we're going to most of the time surgically excise that area. We're going to take it out with a surgery just to make sure, simply because of its features. And then we have um, BIRADS 5. This is our highly suggestive, suggestive of malignancy. So likelihood of malignancy greater than 95%. So these are our slam dunk you look at something and you know this is a cancer. Um, no matter what a biopsy shows, we're going to take it out surgically. So BIRADS 4C and BIRADS 5 almost always result in surgery, no matter what the pathology results might be for a biopsy. So then I get a lot of questions about well, why would we do a biopsy then if these are going to end up going to surgery anyway. The reason for that is if a surgeon's going to take out a cancer, they take out a lot more tissue than if they were going to take out something um, that is benign. So we need a tissue diagnosis first um, to figure out what are we dealing with so we know for surgical planning what type of surgery are, are we doing. The problem with needle biopsy is very accurate type of a procedure, but nothing in life is 100%. So it's possible to have some sort of sampling error where you biopsy something, it comes back basically nothing, just tissue, but it could still be something bad. So that's why we have these BIRADS 5 and BIRADS 4C categories, kind of a fail safe so for things that really look ugly that, that need to get taken out no matter what. And then BIRADS 6 is our last category. This is our biopsy proven, known biopsy proven malignancy. So when we see this category a lot in ultrasound is when a patient has had a biopsy, we found a cancer, um, but the cancer is pretty extensive. Um, often patients, if a cancer is very extensive, will undergo chemotherapy. And we commonly will follow with ultrasound these patients to kind of see what, how is that cancer responding over time to the chemotherapy. Um, many times we do chemotherapy before we do surgery in really extensive cases to try to shrink the cancer. Um, or sometimes um, a patient, after they're diagnosed with their cancer, um, is going through the staging phase of diagnosis. So they're having um, MRIs and all sorts of things, and we may see them back for more ultrasound tests, depending on when, where they found different stuff somewhere. And this is when we're going to see this BIRAD6 category. Mm -hmm. No, so, so um, what BIRAD6 means is this patient has a cancer. We've diagnosed it with a needle biopsy or a surgery or something. And this patient's back to us now, but we already know the area we're looking at is a cancer. No. So 
how do we characterize things um, in ultrasound? Uh, so we look at all these different things um, to try to figure out um, what is a mass doing? Um, and why do we characterize? We characterize, first of all, because we don't want to over biopsy. Um, you know, the first rule in medicine is do no harm. So if something looks very benign, has features that point to 2% or less chance of malignancy, we don't want to biopsy these things. You can safely follow these types of masses. Um, when we over biopsy areas, women don't want to have mammograms. You know, you get increased patient anxiety, you have unnecessary tests. But we also don't want to under biopsy. Um, if you get a mass with one or more malignant features, um, we really want to sample these things. If we don't biopsy things that need biopsies, we could miss a cancer. Um, and also we characterize because we want to differentiate between true findings and pseudo findings, meaning something that is not a true finding on an ultrasound. So all of these characterizations help us do all three of those things. So in the breast, we have major tissue planes. Um, these are the major distinct boundaries between different types of tissues. Um, a benign mass is going to displace or push the tissue planes out of the way. Uh, they do not cross tissue planes, they displace tissue planes. Where malignant masses, they invade. They grow into different tissue planes. They cross tissue planes. Um, so the first distinction between different types of tissue is the major tissue planes. So, you know, just like we just learned, we've got our skin, subcutaneous fat, mammary layer, retromammary fat, pectoralis muscle layers, we, and then we have our chest wall layer, which is all the chest wall structures. So these are our major tissue planes in the breast. But we also have minor tissue planes. Uh, minor tissue planes are all the millions of indistinct little tissue lines running through all of this tissue that you can never see. Um, so if you have a very tiny little mass somewhere in here, you know, it's going to take a lot for that tiny little mass to affect these major tissue planes, but it certainly can affect the little tiny um, tissue planes around it. So a benign mass, what it does is it pushes those little tissue planes out of its way. It displaces things. Um, you cannot see the minor tissue planes on ultrasound. We just always think of tissue planes as running parallel in the breast. So they, they run uh, parallel to the skin and the chest wall layers. So all these minor tissue planes are running this way. So if you have a benign mass, it's going to push these tissue planes out of its way. Well, it just shoves them out of the way. So where if we have a malignant mass or a cancer, all these different tissue planes, it's going to grow or invade through them. So that's the difference. You're either pushing them out of the way or you're growing into them. And it's really hard to show on a diagram, but what cancer actually does is not only invade all these tissue planes, but it sucks all the tissue planes in around it. So it really pulls that tissue in or tethers it. Yep. Sometimes. Yep. So if a cancer is big enough, you'll feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sometimes we find cancers by mammogram or ultrasound tests, and sometimes we find them by symptoms. So it just kind of depends on what the cancer is doing, if it's big enough to detect or not. So we always, in ultrasound, one of the most important features um, of characterization, I would say one of our number one characterizing things is orientation. Um, so I w we used to have a doctor, one of the radiologists, and she always would ask us when we came to present a case, is it a skyscraper or is it a football? And that really stuck in my mind, and so I like to teach it that way because I think it was such a good illustration. So these tissue planes, they run parallel to the skin lines. So we just learned that, you know, benign masses shove tissue planes out of the way. So when you have something that is wider than it is tall, that's a sign that the mass is just shoving those tissue planes out of the way. Or if you have something that is taller than it is wide, it's a sign that it's invading these tissue planes. It's, you know, grabbing all that stuff around it and invading it. 
So, um, and we call them taller than wide and wider than tall. So footballs are wider than tall. This is a benign feature. Skyscrapers are taller than wide. So when we look at a mass on an ultrasound, we care about is it tall or is it wide? That's probably one of the most important features that we look at. Uh, wide things are benign, almost always. Uh, tall things are almost always malignant. Uh, the exception to that, though, is when things get to be gigantic in the breast. So if I have a mass that's maybe taller than wide, but it's huge, you know, they run out of room to grow vertically. You can only grow so far. You run into the skin line, you run into the chest wall layer. So the only way to expand is out. So if you have big cancers, they often are wider than tall because they've run out of room to grow vertically. Um, another way of talking about these terms um, is uh, taller than wide is also called vertical. So sometimes radiologists will say, is the mass vertical or is it horizontal? We also care about shapes of a mass. Um, things that are Oval in shape are our classic benign shaped masses. Um, oval is good because it's wider than it is tall. And when we measure things, you know, are looking at things to try to figure out if something is taller than wide or wider than tall, we look at the AP dimension of something. So the anterior to posterior dimension. This is the most important dimension of a mass. So when I have a mass like this and I'm going to measure it, we take lots of measurements from lots of different directions. But the most important me measurement that we take is the we want to measure from the anterior wall to the posterior wall. And why this is important is if your anterior or AP dimension, or even height, you can call it height, is bigger than your other dimensions, then you know that this mass is a tall mass, and tall masses are bad. Where if your AP dimension is smaller than your other dimensions, then you know that this is a wide mass, and wider masses are benign. So anterior to posterior dimension, most important measurement in ultrasound. So oval masses, almost always benign, because their AP dimension is going to be smaller um, than their length or their width. Mm -hmm. Um, doesn't matter. Mm -mm. And, and in breast imaging, radial or anti-radial is the planes that we measure in. Yep. And it doesn't matter which one you do it in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so our oval category is always going to be benign because that AP dimension. Now, when we get to this round mass here, what do we notice about our AP dimension? It's getting bigger. So round masses are round because they're equal on, on all sides. So a round mass is kind of in our intermediate category. A round mass can be benign or a round mass can be malignant. Why we start worrying about round masses is because their AP dimension starts equaling the other dimension. And that means it's in danger of start going even more vertical. So round masses, we always kind of, depending on what the char other characteristics of it are, round starts to be a category that we pay more attention to because we start thinking about this AP dimension. Is this the type of mass that has the potential to start getting even bigger in an AP dimension? Now some things like cysts, which we'll learn about next week, they can be round and totally fine because a cyst doesn't really have a potential to grow taller or vertical. But solid masses that are round, we worry more about because a solid mass always has the potential to start becoming more vertical. Um, the other category of shape is irregular. So they used to have lots of different shapes. I put up all this stuff. But every few years, radiologists change how they, their features of how they characterize things. So kind of the newest hot off the press way is there's basically three shapes. It's oval, it's round, or it's irregular. Um, and they just you know, found that really sim simplified things. So. This is our newest kind of hot off the press. This is what we're going to use for this class. So if it's not oval or round, it's irregular. Oops. 
we also look at the margins of a mass. So the margins of a mass um, are the edges of a mass. <coughs> and the edges of a mass are an extremely important thing. So, you know, we think of shapes like round, um, oval, triangle, you know, that kind of stuff. That's a shape where a margin is what is the edge of that shape doing. So, for instance, a star, or as we like to call them in ultrasound, a starfish, um, these are your margins that are not, you, you know, they're kind of angular. They're not doing exactly what we want them to do. Where a mass like this, as we look at the margins of it all the way around, you can trace it with your fingers. It's very uh, easy to see all the margins. Um, it, we like things that are like this. So the first category would be circumscribed. And this means when we're looking at the margins, they're smooth all the way around. There's, there's no irregular margins around it. Um, these are your, gonna be your benign category of margins. Um, Smooth and circumscribed are often used interchangeably. Um, then we also have macrolobulated. Um, macrolobulated is a cloud. We call those in ultrasounds. Macrolobulated means that the mass has lobulations. So lobulations are rounded protrusions from a mass. And lobulations can be big or they can be small. When lobulations are big, um, it's a sign that a mass is pushing the tissue planes out of the way, which would be a benign, um, sim, uh, benign feature. When lobulations are tiny, we call them microlobulated or small lobulations, um, that's more of a sign, like here, that the mass is starting to invade um, tissue planes next to it. Um, so we like clouds. Clouds are benign. They're displacing the tissue. We don't like things that um, have little tiny lobulations around them. So our circumscribed, circumscribed margins, our smooth margins, and our macrolobulated or cloud margins are going to all be benign features. And then we get into our malignant margins. So um, angular is our first one. We call these our starfish. Um, something with sharp corners or angles to it is a sign that the mass is invading tissue planes. This is a malignant feature. Um, Microlobulated, which we just talked about a minute ago, tiny, small lobulations on a mass. We like to think of these as the edges of a carnation flower. This is also a sign that a mass is invading tissue planes. Um, Non-circumscribed. Sometimes it's hard to even see the margins of a mass when we're looking at a mass. It may really blend into the tissue. We call that <coughs> non-circumscribed. -circ They're really ill-defined margins. Um, and then you can also have spiculated margins. So spiculated margins means that you have a mass and it has little spicules coming off of it. Spiculations is our most suggestive feature of something that is malignant. If you see spiculations on a mass, that mass is malignant until proven otherwise. So this is our feature most indica indicative of tumor invasion into surrounding tissues. Those are our octopuses. Octopuses are our worst sign that you can see on an ultrasound or on a mammogram. So what happens to the tissue around a cancer? This is where we start talking about the borders of stuff. So when you have a cancer, What the cancer wants to do is it wants to grow. It wants to expand. It's not happy just staying the size that it is. So the cancer says, how can I get bigger? It can get bigger um, by uh, having irregular margins. So if it suddenly grows an angular margin, it's now invading the tissue plane next to it. So an angular margin would be a sign that a mass is trying to grow or invade the tissue planes. They can have little tiny microlobulated margins. This is a sign that it's trying to expand or invade that tissue next to it. 
or it can have little speculations. These are all the ways that tumors try to grow to get bigger. Now the body doesn't want this tumor to keep growing. So the body says, how can I stop this tumor from growing? The way it does it is it makes the tissue hard all the way around the mass. Tissue fibrosis. Hard tissue that's really fibrose is a lot harder for a mass to try to grow into. So when this happens, when the body says, nope, you can't grow, I'm gonna make the tissue really hard so you can't do that, and the mass says, forget you, I'm still gonna grow, and still is trying really hard to make lobulation, microlobulations and spiculations and angular margins, what you get is a bright white, on ultrasound, hyperechoic, thick halo is what we call it. So on our picture here, it's this stuff in the tissue. So it doesn't work? Does the body actually stop it? Apparently? Slows it down, is what we'll say. But cancer always gets its way. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, well, I'll say that. It, it would be incredibly rare for it not to get its way. So um, yeah. the problem is some cancers are incredibly fast growing. So the body doesn't have time to respond to them. So all malignant masses, you will not always see this bright white stuff around it. If you ever do see this thick white stuff around it, we call that desmoplasia. And desmoplasia basically means the body is trying to stop the tumor with tissue fibrosis, and the tumor is trying to keep growing via you know, all the different margins. Um, and it's a combination of all of those things together that makes this thick, bright, hyperechoic halo. So we call it an um, echogenic thick halo. Echogenic is just a term meaning something has echoes in it. So we generally think of echogenic as hyperechoic. Those terms are pretty much used synonymously. Um, so if you see this around a tumor, this is a bad sign. It's a very malignant sign. Would that be a good example of when you might feel about this? Sometimes. Sometimes it can make things more prominent, but not always. Sometimes these things are really embedded in the tissue. Um, so now we're going to talk about the borders of a mass. So the borders of a mass is not the shape of the mass, and it's not the edges of the mass. So not the margins or the shape. It's what's happening in the tissue kind of out here. So the tissue that's immediately surrounding the mass. So um, it actually has nothing to do really with the mass itself. It's the tissue adjacent to the mass. Um, so number one we just learned was malignant borders. This would be our thick hyperechoic halo. So that's our sign over there where tissue fibrosis and tumor expansion are fighting each other, creating this big white area around a mass. Well, that's going to be our malignant border. We call that desmoplasia or a thick hyperechoic halo. Um, our other options are benign borders. So what happens with benign masses? You have your mass. Um, benign masses either have what we call a true capsule, meaning the tissue right outside of it has a, um, a, a thin... Um, echogenic um, capsule surrounds it. Uh, a true capsule is only seen in one type of breast mass, a lipoma. Um, we're going to learn more about that next week. Um, every other mass has what's called a pseudo capsule. So it looks on ultrasound identically to a true capsule. And what a capsule is, it's a connective tissue border. So how do we determine if something has a true capsule or a pseudo capsule if they look identical on an ultrasound. And what it looks like is this thin ring of tissue that's immediately surrounding the mass. So, so right is that image up here. There, that's a lipoma? No. Oh. Nope. So this this one here is actually our pseudo capsule. So oh. it's a it's a white border surrounding a mass. Um, and see it looks much different than this. This is hazy, you can't really see the margins of it. This is nice and circumscribed. You can trace around it all the way around it. Um, 
on ultrasound, we can't tell the difference between a pseudo capsule and a true capsule. Um, what a true capsule is, is when you look under a microscope, the capsule that is surrounding this mass and the tissue adjacent to the mass is made up of a certain type of connective tissue. Where a pseudo capsule, if you look under a microscope, is not quite that connective tissue stuff. It's kind of a pseudo connective tissue. So the only difference really that you can tell between these two is if you look under a microscope. We don't have a microscope in ultrasound. So for us, a true capsule and a pseudo capsule are going to look identical. They're going to look like this white line running around a mass. The only thing that we can tell, and we're going to learn next week what a lipoma is and how to tell when something is a lipoma. When we see a lipoma, we know that histologically or under a microscope, a lipoma has a true capsule. No other breast masses have a true capsule. So they, they either have a pseudo capsule or they have no capsule. So a benign sign on an ultrasound would be a pseudo capsule, a true capsule, or no capsule. Where a malignant sign on ultrasound would be this desmoplasia or thick hyperechoic halo. Question? Oh, I was just going to say, my mm -hmm. had surgery two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, you can get them all over your body. But everywhere Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, lipomas, that's just what they are. They're encapsulated masses. Yep, encapsulated fat. Yep. So on ultrasound, you're either going to see this thin white line around something, and we're, unless it's a lipoma, which we'll learn next week what a lipoma is, it's going to be a pseudocapsule, or you're going to see nothing around a mass, which means it has no border to it. Uh, not generally, but we'll go into that more next week. Okay, so the next thing that we want to talk about is when something is in a milk duct, how does it expand? So we worry about stuff in milk ducts because most cancers that are going to occur in the breast are ductal in origin. So we learned last week that most breast pathology originates in the TDLU. Well, out of that TDLU, the duct is the most significant part that we worry about. Uh, things in ducts can be benign, but we always worry about cancer in a ducts because most cancers start in the milk duct. Well, TDLU has ducts and it's got, you know, a lobule. So, mm -hmm, yeah. So, so pretty much everything is either going to be from the duct or the lobule. The only other part of the breast is the fat. And not many things happen in fat. But we'll learn more about that later. So we basically have two choices. Here's our nipple. On older sound, if we have a duct, it's traveling along here. What we want to figure out is, is the stuff that's in this duct growing towards the nipple or growing away from the nipple? Um, this is an important determination um, for cancer management because we always worry about things invading the nipple. Um, invasion of the nipple is a bad sign. Um, it puts it at a higher stage cancer, so it's important for us to know if things are invading the nipple or not. So how do we determine if something is going towards the nipple or going away from the nipple? So they've come up with these two things. So a duct extension, um, this is where a mass has projections that are going radially. Remember, in the radial plane is how uh, we look at things. Um, in ultrasound, um, and the stuff's within a duct, and it's going towards the nipple. So on this first example here, um, we can see that this stuff is pretty much attached to the nipple. It's grown into the nipple. So we know this stuff is, has um, extended into the nipple. We call this duct extension towards the nipple, where in this case here, um, you know, the duct the stuff ends here, and it's not connected to the nipple, but you see these extensions coming off the end of it, meaning it's starting to grow this way. So it's growing away from the nipple or branching away from the nipple. Um, so if we look for the ends of it. What are the ends doing? If something's not connected to the nipple, is it starting to branch? You remember things that are bad that are growing are going to start getting speculations, angular margins things that kind of branch um, or go outward. 
So we look for the branches. Are the branches near the nipple end or are the branches of this near the uh, end away from the nipple? And where the branches are, are going to tell us, is this area going towards the nipple or away from the nipple? Branch pattern means that the mass has these projections or branches that are going away from the nipple. Um, where duct extension means it's either connected to the nipple or the branches are going towards the nipple. And this is an important determination so they can determine what way is this cancer traveling. Um, no, because we worry about it getting into the nipple itself, which puts you up a whole new level of like cancer management. So that can start spreading to your skin and all sorts of stuff then. Yeah, so nipple is bad. We don't want it to go to the nipple. So things that are going away from the nipple are better. All right, we learned uh, about this before. We look at echo texture. Um, so this is our, um, how evenly distributed the echoes are within a mass. So you can have homogeneous or heterogeneous. Which one do you guys think would be worse? Yeah. So homogeneous is when everything's nice and uniform. Uniform things in the body are good. That's usually a benign sign. Have I seen a homogeneous cancer? Yes. We're complex. See, this is just more jumbled. It's irregular. Things in the body that are irregular um, are more worrisome feature. Have I seen, yeah, it, right, this one particularly is getting much closer to being a skyscraper than being, than being a football. Yeah, um, good pickup. So in something like this, we worry more about it because it's just jumbled. It's not even. Um, have I seen a, a benign mass that looks like this? Yes. So echo texture is not completely reliable. Uh, usually echo texture is only reliable if we combine it with other features, like the margins. Does it have speculated margins? Does it have angular margins? And the orientation, is it taller than it is wide? So echo texture is an important feature, but only when we combine it with other features. All right, and we learned about echogenicity. So in the breast, um, white is good. We like hyperechoic things. Um, hyperechoic things are almost always benign. Uh, things that, that are hyperechoic in the breast um, are almost always a benign finding. The one color of hyperechoic we worry about is the desmoplasia, or that thick echogenic halo around a mass. That's the only time that hyperechoic something is bad. Otherwise, pretty much everything else hyperechoic is good. Um, as we get darker and darker on the spectrum, our hypoechoic category, Lighter hypoechoic is more benign. These are our isoechoic to light hypoechoic. As we get to darker hypoechoic, this is where things start to get more worrisome. So you can see here, our benign module, nodules tend to be more on this lighter spectrum, where our malignant nodules start to get darker hypoechoic. Um, we call it markedly hypoechoic, or really dark gray. This is a very worrisome color in ultrasound, but Echogenicity, just like echo texture, really has to be combined with other features. Have I seen benign masses that are markedly hypoechoic? Yes. So you really have to combine it with a whole bunch of features to see is this really something that's worrisome or not. Um, now when we get all the way to the other end of the spectrum, anechoic, meaning no echoes in it, um, these are our benign categories. Anechoic is almost always benign. So we, we learned before, anechoic, no echoes compared to surrounding fat. Complex means you know lots of different echoes present, solid and cystic masses. Hypoechoic is less echoes than the surrounding fat. Hyperechoic, mo more echoes than surrounding fat. And then isoechoic, same amount of echoes as the surrounding fat. And then we also look at the echo pattern. Um, echo pattern, posterior echo pattern is how much attenuation um, how much sound wave attenuation is occurring through a mass. So if there's no sound wave attenuation through a mass, we're going to get this brighter enhancement behind it. Where if the sound waves are stopped by this mass, you're going to get this dark shadow behind her, or greater attenuation through this mass. Um, generally, we worry about shadowing more than we worry about enhancement. Have I seen a cancer with enhancement? Yes. Have I seen a, ca have I seen a benign mass with shadowing? Yes. We're going to learn more about how to look at those next week. Um, so 
echo pattern is also one of those categories that really has to be combined with other features. Um, if you just look at enhancement or shadowing alone, that can't tell you whether something's benign or malignant. We learned a little bit about this before. Uh, if something is compressible or it's a soft mass, um, usually it's going to be benign. Whereas something is hard and non-compressible, usually it's going to be malignant. And then we learned last week in lab about Doppler. So color Doppler. Um, this shows us the direction of blood flow and velocity, and it assigns different um, colors to different speeds and directions, where power Doppler only is going to give us the presence or absence of blood flow. Um, and this is measuring the strength of the Doppler signal instead of the shift in frequency. And then we have our spectral Doppler. This lets us take a little sample gate and interrogate one little tiny piece of a vessel, and it gives us a waveform so we know the characteristics of that vessel. Uh, this is the different types, categories of vascularity you can have. So vascularity means blood flow within a mass. Uh, what, what, is the, what is the vascularity pattern doing? And we care about this in masses because it, it's one other clue as far as benign or malignant. Um, what we worry about is if there's a large amount of vascularity in a mask, what we call hypervascularity, which would be this below category down here. Um, what the first thing cancers are going to do is, um, is grow their own blood supply. They grow their own blood vessels. We call this neoangiogenesis. Um, the reason cancers grow their own blood supply is they want to grow faster than a normal cell would grow. The um, only way they can do that is by having lots of blood flow. So they do this to support their accelerated growth rate. So things that are hypervascular, that's generally a bad sign. Can you have a hypervascular mass that's benign? Yes. But generally hypervascular things can be, are a worrisome sign. Um, you can also have hypovascularity. Um, that's kind of this category where you just have a little bit of vascularity. Um, we call it kind of a weak amount of blood flow. Generally your benign mass is going to have hypovascularity. Uh, vascularity is, is kind of smack dab in the middle between, you know, those, ca those categories. Um, generally, it's kind of like a medium amount of vascularity. Um, although some radiologists don't want to describe how much vascularity is in a mass, they think that kind of ties them or locks them into something. So some of them will just say the mass has internal vascularity. So vascularity may just be a, si a term used to show that the mass has some sort of vascularity in it. Then we also have avascular. Avascular means there's no color Doppler or power Doppler signal within the color box, within this mass. We also look at the pattern of the vascularity. Peripheral vascularity. This is where our blood flow is going to be around the perimeter of a mass. This is generally a more benign sign. Where central vascularity, where vascularity is in the center of the mass. This is generally a more worrisome sign. And the reason for this is cancers grow their own blood supplies. So you have your cancer. The cancer is going to grow this blood supply, and it's now a feeding vessel is what we call them. So it's a vessel that feeds the middle of that tumor. So things that go in towards the middle, big feeding vessels like this, we worry about those. In the breast. You guys learned last week about the normal flow pattern. So in the breast, vessels are very small. You guys learned how easily compressible they are in the breast. Um, they have a very low velocity to them. Um, they're not like other vessels in the breast. They're, they're so small, the velocity is low. So often, we have to change the settings on the machine to pick up such tiny little flow velocities. Um, they're also low resistance and low pulsatility. We'll learn about those in just a minute. Um, in the breast, there's many conditions that where you're going to have increased amounts of blood flow in the tissues that's considered normal. So in pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, the, breast t the blood flow in the tissue increases to help uh, stimulate all that, you know, uh, the tissue's getting ready to breastfeed. So it needs more blood flow to, to get all those lobules and stuff to proliferate. Um, also in inflammation and infection, the tissue is going to be stimulated. Uh, we're going to learn about that in a minute. You're going to have more blood flow. Um, you see more blood flow in m both malignant and benign masses. And then ductal masses um, always, almost always have um, increased amounts of blood, blood flow. 
So this is a normal pattern in the breast, a waveform in the breast. So just a little bit about spectral Doppler basics. So first we're going to learn about arteries. So arteries take blood flow from the heart and they pump it all over the body. When we put a spectral Doppler um, into an artery, um, the, the little sample volume, it's going to give us a waveform. The waveforms are generally going to be above the baseline, is what we look at, and it's going to have a pattern to it. So a pretty typical pattern for an artery uh, looks like that. Uh, sometimes they can go below the baseline and then back up, or sometimes they're all completely above the baseline. Generally, arteries are going to be above that baseline that we saw last week where a vein is going to be generally below the base baseline. Um, okay, so let me go to the next slide here. I think it explains it better. Um, we also look at the velocity or how fast the blood is moving. And we know that based on the scale that's on the side of the artery, there's two things that we want to look at. So when we look at our waveform, it's split into two different portions. You have systole and diastole, the two different phases of the heart. Um, this gives us our two portions of our waveform. So we always want to look at what we call the peak systole, or the highest point, and then the end diastole, which is the end part, the bottom part of um, diastole. And this gives us our, um, where our lowest diastole is. So velocity means how fast is the blood flow moving in that certain particular area. And then we also, also look at the waveform pattern. So for veins, um, we're going to learn more about this in just a minute, an abnormal pattern for a vein would be flow that just continues. It doesn't change at all. It doesn't accelerate or decelerate in response to anything. Something that's continuous flow is going to have no shape to it. It's just going to be kind of flat all the way across. Um, where something that's phasic for a vein, veins are phasic, meaning they, their blood flow increases and decreases in response to respiration. So as we look at a vein's pattern, um, here's going to be our peak flow from our scale over here, where this is going to be our minimum flow. So this is an acceleration right here, where this is a deceleration. So as a person breathes, the flow is going to accelerate and then decelerate, and then accelerate and decelerate. We call that phasic, meaning it varies in response to respiration or breathing. Arteries are the opposite. Um, they're pulsatile, meaning instead of varying by breathing, they vary in response to the heart. So arteries care more about what is the heart doing. So as the heart pumps, um, they do make a very pulsatile pattern. So you can often hear them when you do the Doppler. You guys probably heard that last week. So what an artery is doing is it's going. So this is our, your arterial pattern. Um, so this flow is accelerating. And then it's decelerating and accelerating and decelerating. And we know that because our scale here measures how high. Where highest flows are going to be like up here, you know, lowest flows, whoops, are going to be by our baseline here. So high flow or highest part of um, this accelerated means um, this is in response to the cardiac contractions of the heart. So as that heart pumps, flow accelerates, decelerates, accelerates, decelerates. We call this a pulsatile pattern. So what's the difference between something with high pulsatility and low pulsatility? Um, we really look at the peaks of something. So if something has a really pointy peak to it and it's a very thin waveform, this is a high pulsatility pattern. Or if something has more of a broad peak, it's a lot wider to measure across the top, this is more of a low pulsatility pattern. So I often look at the actual waveform itself. So something that's nice and thin and pretty is high pulsatility. Something that's more ragged like this, this would be our low pulsatility signal. So with veins, veins can also um, be affected by the heart. 
veins are always going to be phasic, meaning the flow accelerates and decelerates in response to breathing. But the closer a vein gets to the heart, um, that vein is going to be affected by that beating heart. So the central veins are the veins that are really close to the heart. And this is um, like your superior vena cava, uh, internal jugular vein. These types of veins are near, you know, closer to the heart um, and neck area. Instead of seeing these, this phasic pattern where on, in a vein it's rounded, this is what a vein does, meaning it's phasic, you start seeing one that's got more sharp peaks. So veins that are close to the heart, you're going to see these sharp peaks. This means it's got kind of a pulsatile signal to it. It's still accelerating and deceleration, um, accelerating and deceleration in response to um, the breathing, but because it's so close to the heart, it's starting to get these peaks where if you have a vein that's farther away from the heart, this is going to be your normal venous pattern, these rounded peaks. We also look at the resistance of a pattern on spectral Doppler. Um, we care about the diastole. So you remember that our waveform is split into two. It's to split into two segments, so systole and diastole. So we want to find out what is the waveform doing in systole and what is it doing in diastole. Um, for resistance, we care about what's happening in diastole. So what's happening in this last component of the waveform. Things that stay above the baseline um, don't come down here and touch the baseline at all. Here's our baseline on the waveform pattern, or what we call a low resistance pattern, where things that are going to go either below the baseline um, and then come back down, those are going to be our high resistance patterns. So what we're looking for is does it have this flow reversal component, meaning it goes back down below the baseline. Um, this is what high resistance flow does, where in this case there's no flow reversal. It doesn't go back below the baseline, it stays above the baseline. So what high resistance means, um, there's not as much flow going back to the heart. So high resistance vessels they pump the blood, pump, 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 but it's not constant flow going to that tissue. It means there's flow when you pump and then no flow for a time, and then flow and then no flow, and flow and then no flow. Where low resistance, they're pumping, but there's constant flow going throughout both systole and diastole. So there's no sort of flow reversal. So there's some parts of your body that have to have constant flow. It can't wait for it to pump and then come back, and then pump and then come back. You, as you're pumping, you have to have flow just to, for every phase of both systole and diastole. These are our low resistance things. So things that, such as our brain, we have to have continuous flow going to them. Our kidneys, um, you know, ovarian and testicular arteries, all of these are things that are essential to have flow going to them. So these are going to be more of our low resistance patterns. So if we look at a waveform, uh, this is going to be a high resistance pattern. You're going to have that flow reversal in diastole, where here's our low resistance pattern, meaning it stays, it doesn't reverse. So these are your things that have continuous flow going to them. These are your things that have uh, flow uh, throughout systole, but then in diastole, you're going to lose some of that flow. Transducer pressure. You guys learned about this last week. And if you press in the breast, um, those little vessels collapse. So here is the same mass. This is the actual blood flow pattern in this mass. This is with too much transducer compression. So if I don't use really light compression when I'm using color Doppler, the doctor won't see any of the true flow that's in the mass. We also care about the box that size. So we want a box that's big enough to see the tissue around the mass. Um, that's not cutting off part of the mass. Um, it's got to be small enough that you're going to get um, good sensitivity. The bigger your color box is, the less color sensitivity you're going to have, be able to pick up, which is really important in the breast because um, vessels are so tiny, they're hard to pick up anyway. Uh, so if you have a gigantic box, which is the entire size of your screen here, 
Um, you're not going to have very much flow sensitivity. It's not going to be picking up much in here. Um, or if you have a box that's too small, it's cutting off part of your mass. You can't see all of the vascularity. So you want something that you can see the surrounding tissue plus the mass itself. We also worry about where is the box. You don't want to have the box on the edge of a mass because you're missing all of this information over here. Your mass should always be centered in your color box. And then we care about the gain, the color gain. So uh, this is noise. All this color signal is extra. Um, it's not the true flow, which is this stuff in here. So if your gain is up too high, you're going to get noise in your box. Um, we want, so here's a couple of different signals. So color gain's too high. We're getting a lot of noise in our box here. Um, in this mass here, this mass is the same as this mass. In this mass, I was using the correct amount of transducer pressure, which was barely any pressure, but my color gain wasn't up high enough. So here's what it should look like, and here's what it was because my color gain was too low. When I turn my color gain up, here's my correct. So when we're setting color gain, what we want to do is turn that color knob all the way up till we get noise in the box, then we turn it down just until the noise disappears. That's your correct color gain. So we talked a little bit about hypervascularity already. We worry about masses that have lots of blood flow to them because um, you know cancers grow their own blood supply. You can have hypervascularity in a benign mass, which we'll learn next week, though. Um, if you see blood flow in a mass, this 100% confirms this is a solid tissue mass. Uh, cysts, cysts, or fluid in the breast, have no blood flow, avascular. Um, one thing that cysts can do to fool us is you can have debris in a cyst and it can move around. Well, what blood flow, do, what the Doppler signal does is it picks up that movement so it can mimic the presence of blood flow. So if you see something moving in a mass, be really careful of is it particles that are moving that are creating your Doppler signal or is it a true Doppler signal. Um, generally, it's hard to do a Doppler signal on something that's moving a lot because um, it's not going to be a very accurate thing. Um, but what if a mass looks solid, but it doesn't have any blood flow? So does the absence of blood flow confirm a mass is cystic? No. So you can have a solid mass that has zero blood flow in it, and it can still be solid tissue. So what blood flow tells us is that a mass is solid, but if there's no blood flow, that doesn't really give us much information. For benign masses, we like to have low pulse, low pulse volatility signals, um, which means we're having this broad pattern here. And we want um, low resistance. So we want constant you know, flow going to these masses. Um, and often, these Doppler peaks are going to be a little bit more rounded, maybe not quite as sharp. Where our um, malignant solid masses tend to have a really high pulse volatility signal and they tend to be high resistance patterns in the breast. Um, Doppler peaks tend to be a little bit more sharp, uh, a little bit less rounded. Um, the caveat to this is uh, with inflammation and infection in the breast, you're going to have uh, more flow going to the area. So sometimes with inflammation and infection, you might see these more high resistance, high pulse volatility patterns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a little one on the kind of the end edge of the vessel I was Dopplering there. Mm -hmm. All right, so what else can a mass tell us? Uh, we look at the center of a mass. If you have a cystic area or anechoic area, which we'll learn next week, in the middle of a mass we call the central necrosis. Uh, this is a really worrisome feature in a mass. And why we care about this is large masses, when they outgrow their blood supply, they're growing faster than their blood supply can help with them the center of the mass dies. When you get this tissue death or necrosis, the center of the mass is going to become cystic like this. So cystic in the middle of a really worrisome looking mass um, is a bad sign. Now can you have a benign mass that has cystic areas in the, excuse me, in the center? Yes. Um, so when we worry about this is the mass has to have malignant features to it. So the borders or edges or something has to be worrisome besides just that cystic space. Um, it's not a reliable indicator if we use it on its own.
The other thing we look at is uh, calcification. So a mass can have um, calcifications inside of it, or it can have a calcified rim around it. Um, so in this case, this is a calcified rim around it. It can look a lot like a um, pseudo capsule or a true capsule on a mass. Really the only distinguishing feature between that is this calcified rim. Calcium so dense, it creates this big dark shadow down below it. So if you see a big dark shadow below a rim, or uh, below a calcified rim, calcified rims are a benign sign in masses, even though they look very scary and worrisome, very benign feature. And if you see big calcifications inside something, uh, bigger is better. Big is almost always benign, where tiny calcifications can be benign or malignant, but uh, many of them can be worrisome. So tiny little things we worry about more than big things. Um, you can also have septations in a mass. Septations are um, soft, they're, they're actually um, solid tissue uh, gross inside of a mass. So uh, we worry about septations more when they're thicker. Um, the thicker they are, anything over one millimeter that starts to get to be too thick. Um, or if they have blood flow in them. So this mass here has a big calcification. And calcifications cause shadowing. So some of the shadowing is due to this big calcification. Some is due to this calcified rim around it. And in this case, this mass has little teeny, teeny, tiny calcifications. This is a more worrisome mass. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do we actually measure septations, or do you just kind of guess? Eyeball it. That was less than one millimeter. Yeah, yeah. Just to give, I got a lot of questions last year about, well, what size? So I actually asked one of our radiologists. So. Um, and we're not going to ever measure a septation, but you were just kind of glancing at it. Does it look gigantic or does it look really tiny? Yeah. Uh, so the next category we're going to look at is skin invasion. So um, what we worry about with cancer is that it invades the skin. If it invades the skin, that's a, a way that cancers take off and really spread. So as cancers start to invade the skin, the thin layer becomes thickened. So we learn normal skin thickness is two millimeters or less. Um, so you see this skin layer here is quite thick. Here's skin layer, quite thick here. And also you start to get lots of little speculations, lots of little extensions off of it. If you guys can see that here in the picture. These are signs that a mass has invaded the skin. <laughs> and this is the result of when it's invaded the skin. This is what the skin looks like. We call this pewdie orange or orange peel skin. Um, if something um, just starts this process, it's not quite to this process yet, you may see one little dimple, um, we call that dimpling, and this is where in that particular area it hasn't maybe invaded the skin yet, but um, it's retracted a Cooper's ligament, so it may pull that skin in in just one little segment. So multiple wispy extensions going into skin that's thickened, that's a sign that a tumor has extended into the skin line. We also worry about has something extended to the nipple. This also is a, a bad feature for a cancer. So we'll see cancers and we'll see extensions going to the nipple. Um, what happens when something invades the nipple, it starts pulling the nipple in. We call this nipple inversion. And then we also look for pectoral invasion. So here's our pectoralis muscle on this, on this image here. Um, when something like this, an ugly mass, is close to the pectoralis muscle, we worry about is it invading the chest wall. So anything that's close to the pectoralis muscle, what you need to do is figure out is this mass fixed to that you know, chest wall or not fixed to that chest wall. You have the patient take a big deep breath in and then ha release that breath out. And you're watching what does this mass do? Something that's not fixed to this chest wall um, the patient's going to breathe and it, it will move independently of the muscle. Something that is fixed, this will move it the same way that the pectoralis muscle moves. It'll be fixed to that. If something's not fixed to it, we measure the distance between that and the muscle to show the radiologist, hey, in this case, there's 6.7 millimeters, or sorry, 0 0.6 millimeters, so less than a millimeter between this mass and this wall. When something grows into the chest, then we're also talking about a whole new level of cancer. Well, in breast imaging, 
radiologists almost always check everything. So it's pretty uncommon for you to do breast ultrasound without a radiologist present. So they're pretty much evaluating everything. Fixed means it's now invaded that chest wall layer. Not fixed means it's not invaded the chest wall layer. So if something's gone into another layer, yep, it attaches itself and starts growing in. Yeah, so if something's into your nipple, into your skin, or into your chest wall layer, we're talking about a whole different level of cancer than if it's just in the breast tissue. So how does cancer spread? So the first thing cancer spreads by, we learned about this desmoplasia, it grows all these different margins and tries to expand locally or you know, invade the tissue next to it. Um, we call that local spread or direct extension. After it goes through that process, it, you know, tiny little speculations start going out of the mass and little masses, it starts growing little masses away from it. We can't always even see the connections between these masses, but we call these satellite nodules. So anytime we found, find an ugly mass in the breast, we want to start hunting for what we call these satellite nodules. Uh, we had one radiologist that always called it a mothership with her little baby ships. And she said, <laughs> a lot of motherships have baby ships. So the first thing she'd ask us when we came to you know, show her something, if it looked ugly, was, did you find any baby ships? We call these satellite nodules. So that's kind of always stuck with me. I'm always thinking when I'm scanning, if I see something ugly, where are the baby ships? Um, very common to have these little satellite nodules. If we find one, so here's our ugly mass. I found one right here. We want to find out how far apart they are from each other. We'll find out next week why that matters, but it's a, it depends on how far apart things are in the breast determines how they manage a cancer. So like lumpectomy versus mastectomy, that kind of thing. Uh, no. So no, it's not metastasis, it's just spreading. Yeah, so metastasis means it's gonna go somewhere distantly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can't really see it so well in this picture, it's not a great picture, but this mass had like speculations coming off of it, it was hypervascular. Actually, part of this mass is over here. So yeah, it, it's really hard to see in the picture. I was just trying to find one that had a satellite nodule with it, which was hard. <laughs> um, so. How does cancer spread? Um, it's what happens is cancer grows all around it, expands. As it expands, it gets to the lymph vessels and it gets to the arteries, generally, um, or sometimes even the veins. And that cancer invades into that artery or lymph vessel or vein wall. And as it invades in there, it then spreads along that artery lymph vessel or vein. And this is where we talk about metastasis. This means it's split, spreading via either the bloodstream, via the artery or the vein, um, or this lymph system, and it's going to distant sites in the body. Whenever these cancer cells then get to the distant site, they once again go invade or grow through that vessel wall, either artery, lymph vessel, or vein, and then they start growing a new mass. The new mass, they grow in a different part of the body is what we call metastasis. It's now spread somewhere else in the body. So for breast cancer, um, the veins, commonly, commonly breast cancers will grow into the veins. This is a really common spread to the vertebral column. So vertebral column um, is a very common site for breast cancer to spread to. Um, also, there's a lot of extensive lymphatic network in the breast. Um, so it travels through these lymph vessels to the lymph nodes. So we commonly see breast cancers in the lymph nodes and the axilla. All right, so now we're gonna uh, take a break, about maybe five minutes, and then we're gonna do some case studies.